Hello, and uh, welcome back to WIMBA. Uh, this is Professor Young, and we are continuing with part two of three, uh, looking at ch- uh, the chapter on biochemistry. Um, we have so far um, gone through and done a brief overview and introduction into molecular structure, uh, some of the key um, players within the physiological realm, such as electrolytes and free radicals, um, and the importance that they play within maintaining homeostasis or possibly not maintaining homeostasis. Uh, We've talked about bonding and exactly how that happens and uh, why that is so critical, um, especially when we look at water's role and being a polar substance and and what that means. Um, And... um, Pretty much that's where we kind of left off uh, with the first part of uh, our chapter on biochemistry um, was all of the various uses and functions um, water has within the body. What we need to start moving into now uh, is kind of an understanding of these key four macromolecules that we have. Uh, which we're going to be starting to look at during this session and finish up with the next one, this session, um, part three of three for the biochemistry chapter. Before we get there, though, we have a couple little odds and ends that we need to tie up, um, molarity being one of them, and I also want to spend a few minutes kind of going over acid and base chemistry um, and really what it means to be organic versus non-organic. Uh, and so uh, we're going to look at that, and then we're going to jump into uh, the whole unit or the whole discussion on biochemistry. Um, and so with that said, uh, we were talking about molarity uh, being uh, how much of a solute uh, is dissolved within solution and I tried to make the case or tried to make the point that molarity goes beyond just a percent of solute, um, that it also ties in molecular weight. How much does a molecule of X weigh? How much does a molecule of B weigh? These are things that we cannot easily see. You cannot see an individual molecule of sodium chloride. You are not looking at an individual molecule of hydrochloric acid. You cannot see an individual molecule of potassium chloride. You cannot uh, grasp or tangibly, tangibly handle in your hand one individual molecule of any substance. Now, we can give you a crystal of sodium chloride. We can give you a gram of sodium chloride, but we cannot give you one NaCl and be able to tangibly hold that. They're just too minute. They are too small. And so to be able to compare, when we say X amount of grams of this and X amount of grams of that, How much or how many molecules are we dealing with? Are they even comparable to one another? And that's where this whole idea of really looking at molarity comes into play. It is based off of, as you can see right here, it is based off of molecular weight. How much does a molecule of this really weigh? And if we... Uh, try to standardize this, how much of this is going to equal how much of that. And th- when, we, when we look at it in those terms, this becomes critical. Avogadro's number. Right? Because a mole of something, a mole of something, means that basically there is six point. 0, 2, 3 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of that substance within one mole. Right, now, just to kind of give you an appreciation of what 
0.023 times 10 to the 23rd equals, here's, where, here's what we have. Uh, we have 6, 0, 2, 3, um, and then we have 20 zeros that follow that. Uh, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. There it is. All right. And so if you start to put in uh, your little uh, commas and everything like that every three, um, we have, I don't even think I can come up with a number as far as what this legitimately equals. But each of these lines is going to represent a comma. Uh, and so uh, here we have, and this is going to sound stupid, but bear with me. Um, here we have uh, our um, hundreds, thousands, uh, millions, billions, trillions, quadrillions. Um, basically, we're dealing with 60 um, centillion molecules. 60 centillion molecules uh, of something in one mole. Now, this is going to vary because, again, we're going back to molecular weight and how that transponds or translates into grams. So let me just kind of review this one more time. Avogadro's number, 6.023 times 10 to the, uh, times 10 to the 23rd power, simply means that in one mole of anything, in one mole of anything, there is 60 centillion molecules found in that mole. What a mole is, is the molecular weight. It's the molecular weight of a molecule, and that translates into grams. So if the molecular weight of a substance is 160, then one mole equals 160 grams. And within those 160 grams, we have one mole or 60 centillion molecules. That's what all of that gobbledygook comes down to. How do we calculate out... Um, how do we calculate out uh, that molecular weight? Well, on the periodic table, which is what you're looking at here, we have various um, atomic masses for each element. And so you can see here for, uh, for uh, hydrogen, the atomic mass is 1.007. Um, for iron, here Fe, the atomic mass of one molecule of iron is 55.84. Um, for uh, phosphorus, one molecule equals 30.97. For argon, it equals 39.94. Um, for neon, it equals 20.97. Right? And so you can kind of get an idea that each one of these atoms, one individual atom, has a certain amount of molecular weight to it. And that is calculated by looking at how much do the protons weigh and how much do the electrons weigh and adding those together. Now, I will also say that protons are much heavier than electrons. And so the bulk of the mass of an atom of anything is coming from the protons. Neutrons, they're neutral. They, they're negligible. They don't even factor into the equation. So, let's look at this. For example, uh, if we take, and I'm going to use the same examples that I used in class, if we take two sugars that we are comparing, and I'm going to do that right down here at the bottom, I think, um, glucose, which is uh, C6H12O6, and I apologize because I can't um, subscript the, uh, the numbers here, so just imagine that they're small numbers. Um, each carbon is going to have a specific mass. And we can see right here that carbon indeed 
has a molecular weight of 12.01. And so if we multiply six, because there's six carbons, times 12.01, we actually end up getting um, 72.06 for carbon. That's the molecular weight of carbon within glucose. And if we look at the hydrogens, we see that hydrogen has a molecular weight of 1.07. And that since we have 12 hydrogens, uh, the total molecular weight of hydrogen is 7, or 12, I'm sorry. And oxygen has a molecular weight of 15.99. And that we have 6 oxygens in glucose, 6 times 15.99, 6 times 15.99 is going to give us 95.94 for the total of oxygen. And when we add all of that good stuff together, we get for glucose, we get a molecular weight of 180. We get a molecular weight of 180. So that means 180 grams of glucose equals one mole within 100 and 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd molecules of glucose. If we compare that to sucrose, which is D12H22O11, all right, and we go through and we do the exact same thing again, 12 carbons times 12.01, 22 hydrogens times 1, and 11 oxygens times 15.99, then what we end up with on the flip side is, and again, this is sucrose, it's another sugar, um, a uh, molecular weight of 342, which means it takes 342 grams of sucrose to equal one mole. And within those 300 or 342 grams of sucrose, there are uh, 6 point, uh, 6.032 times, or I'm sorry, 6.023 times 10 to the 23rd power molecules of sucrose within that 342 grams. Both of these, and this is what starts to boggle the mind sometimes, both of these both the sucrose and the glucose, both of them equal one mole. They both equal one mole. And so from time to time, you're going to hear molarity or ozomolarity. Right? And what we're talking about is the, the molecular concentration of individual um, molecules that are present within the body. That is important. Let me give you, an, uh, uh, for instance, muscle contraction. In order for the muscle con to contract, there is a long, complicated cascade of events that we are going to learn at nauseum later on in the semester. But, but, um, in order for that reaction to start, very often, all it takes is for one or two, maybe three molecules of sodium and potassium to move. We're not talking about large amounts. We're talking three, four, maybe five at the most molecules, individual little um, non-tangible molecules to cross the membrane. And that's enough to spark an electrical discharge to have your muscles con to uh, contract. That's why we have to understand molar concentration. So kind of bear with that and keep that all in mind. 
one of the other key concepts that we need to understand here is acids and bases and, and, and how they have an impact on the overall body. Naturally, when we deal with acids and bases, we're dealing with pH. Uh, and hopefully, one of the things that you know and understand is that we have a pH scale. And that pH scale is going to go from, at the lower end, I'm going to use zero because it's a nice round number. Uh, it's going to go from zero to, at the upper end, fourteen. With the middle being seven. Right now, anything, anything with a seven or below, anything with a seven below uh, of a pH is going to be acid or acidic. Anything with a seven or higher for pH is going to be basic or alkaline with a 7 being neutral. What it means to be an acid is that that molecule is going to give up or release a proton. And that proton is going to be attached to hydrogen. And so acids release protons that are attached or synced to hydrogen, and it releases it within the water. Once that hydrogen is released into the water, we have created something that we refer to as H3O, or hydronium. Hydronium. And so let me give you an example here. Uh, we have... HCl, hydrochloric acid. That hydrochloric acid is going to disassociate into two things within water. It's going to break up in water. Why? Because water is polar. It's got an electronegativity. And we know that we can simply split the hydrogen and the chlorine into its individual ions, which is what we're technically doing. And when we do that, when we do that, we are releasing a hydrogen ion, which again is going to combine with H2O to form hydronium or H3O, and we also release a chlorine ion. So we've got free-floating chlorine ions within the water. We've got a free-floating hydrogen ion, which is going to bind to water and form hydronium, and that is what creates the acid. That is what creates the acid right there. When we talk about a base, we actually go in reverse. A base is going to be a chemical that's going to be added to water that's going to pull hydrogen ions away. It's actually going to pull hydrogen ions away, and typically it's going to pull it away from water. And when it does that, when it does that, the... Um, uh, the base removes a hydrogen ion from water. So water, keep in mind, is H2O. If we pull a hydrogen away from that, we're basically now splitting water into OH and H+. Plus. And keep in mind that that H plus binds to the base. It binds to the base. And so now we have a whole bunch of these free-floating hydroxide ions. I'm going to put that term right over here. 
They have hydroxide that is now floating around. High levels or high concentrations of hydroxide within water or within a solution equals a base. So another way of looking at this is uh, we're dealing with individual molecules of hydrogen ions. We're dealing with molarity. We're dealing with molarity of hydrogen ions. If there is an overabundance of hydrogen ions free-floating in the water that's going to bind to the water, you're going to have an acid. If there is a reduced amount of hydrogen ions that's available within the water, you're pulling it from the water and binding it to another molecule, you're going to create hydroxide, which is going to form a base. So, I know I make this stuff like way more interesting than what it needs to be probably. Um, a pH of less than 7 simply indicates that you have more hydrogen ions than what you do hydroxide ions. And a pH greater than 7 means that you have more hydroxide ions than what you do hydrogen ions. And everybody's happy when hydrogen ions are equal to hydroxide ions. Because when hydrogen ions are equal to hydroxide ions, you've got yourself a neutral solution. As we talked about in class, um, pH, by definition, is the measure of hydrogen concentration. pH is all about measuring hydrogen ion concentration. This is it. This is what, this is what everything is about right there. It's about that concentration of hydrogen ions. You have a lot of hydrogen concentra ion concentration, it's an acid. You don't have a whole lot, it's a base. But it's based off of a logar logarithmic scale. It's based off of an exponential growth factor. And in order to really grasp that, we have to look at what the equation is of pH. Right? pH is, and I'm going to highlight this, the negative log of 10 to a negative n, pH is the negative log of 10 to the negative n. If it's a negative 3, then the pH is 3. If it's a negative 6, then the pH is 6. If it's a negative 10, then the pH is a, ne is a 10. So it's a negative log of 10 to a negative n, whatever that concentration of hydrogen is going to be and or not be. The reason why we have a negative in front of that little exponent there is because we're dealing with such a minute amount of the molecule. The 10 that is right there means that this is a scale by which we are going to increase by 10. Every time we go from a – let me just do this real quick because it's going to bug me. You've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I'm going to take this up to ten just for fun. And I'm going to start this right about here. Bear with me one more second. Hold on. Excuse me one second. Uh, so what is before you right here is, here's your scale. Right? Zero to presumably uh, 14. When we move from 2 to 3 on the pH scale, we're not just increasing by a factor of 1. We are actually increasing by a factor of 
10. And when we move from 3, or when we move from 2, to 4, we're not moving by a factor of 2. We're actually moving by a factor of 100. Because every time we move, we're increasing another tenfold step. And when we increase from 2 to 5, it's not just a simple jump of 3. It's actually a jump of a thousand. And so it's a tenfold increase in the concentration of hydrogen ions that we are experiencing. That's what that 10 means. Graphically, if we want to talk about this from the perspective of a graph, here's what we need to consider. Normally, if this was a arithmetic um, or linear scale, what would we see happen is you would just simply increase at a nice steady rate. And so the numbers over here would be like 1, 2, 3, 4, like such. Well, what actually happens is not this, but what actually happens is we end up with a growth that is more consistent with exponential growth. So we see a very rapid increase um, of growth. And so we actually go from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000. That is much different than 1, 2, 3, 4. And so the power of the concentration increases by 10 means. That's what that 10 means. The log, the log there is what tells us that it's not a linear scale. The 10 tells us we increase by a power of 10. The log means that it's not a linear in, uh, increase, but it's an exponential increase. Now, the negative sign in front of the log is just to counteract or cancel out the negative that is associated with that exponent. Those two negatives cancel out, and that turns that number into a positive. That turns that number into a positive. And so if it was a negative log of a concentration of 10 to the negative 6, the pH is 6. And we can take that a step further and say that a 6 is 10 times stronger than a pH. I'm sorry, a 5 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of a 6. A 6 is 10 times more basic than a pH of a 5. A 6 is, is 100 times less acidic than a pH of a 4. A 6 is 1,000 times less acidic than a pH of a 3. 8 is 1,000 times less acidic than a pH of a 6. 7 is 10 times, I'm sorry, 8 is 100 times, sorry, uh, less acidic than a pH of a 6. A 7 is 10 times less acidic than a pH of a 6. And that's exactly how we work this back and forth. Back and forth. Now, to help us resist these changes, because this change can happen with a split second. Remember, it doesn't take uh, a whole wild amount of hydrogen ions to really cause a massive change. In order to resist this change, the body has developed buffers. And buffers simply are able to absorb extra hydrogen ions or release hydrogen ions to try to maintain homeostasis. For example, the pH of blood is 7.3 to about 7.5. It's a very, very, very narrow range. Very narrow range. And so the constantly moving back and forth, back and forth. When we, when we combine an acid and a base, what we create are salts. 
Salts are what are created from mixing acids and bases together. As an example, so this is the same example that we used in class. Hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. Hydrochloric acid being HCl, that is an acid. NaOH being sodium hydroxide, that is a base. When you mix hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide together, they both combine and in the presence of water, they simply rearrange themselves. They disassociate and come back together again. And when they do that, they release water and create salt, NaCl. You take hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, mix the two together, and you come out with table salt and some water. They completely neutralize one another. Completely neutralize one another. Same thing that happens when you mix sodium hydroxide. I'm sorry, it's the same thing that happens when you mix baking soda and vinegar. Baking soda is a base. Vinegar is an acid. I'm not sure what the, the, the salt is that's created. I have to go through and look that up. Um, but it's the same thing. And again, the reason for that has to do with our good old friends, the buffers. They resist change. When it's alkaline, they're going to release hydrogen ions. That's going to drop the acidity. When it's too acidic, buffers are going to absorb in hydro, uh, are going to absorb hydrogen ions, and that's going to turn it more basic. It's a back and forth, back and forth game. Um, this here is just a typical pH scale. Um, some common food items that are on it and, uh, and other household items. Uh, you can take a look at this on your own time. You've got that in your printout. Word about hydrogen bonds, just because I would be an awful anatomy professor if I did not mention hydrogen bonds to you. Um, hydrogen bonds are simply bonds that are going to hold polar molecules together. They're going to hold polar molecules together. They are typically a, a, a weak bond in that um, it doesn't take much to break them, but they can hold lots of energy. They can hold lots of energy. Right. And so that's, that's what we kind of need to understand about that. Um, when we talk about organic versus inorganic, the key things that I need you to understand is simply that organic molecules are going to contain carbon and hydrogen. The other thing that you need to be aware of is that they are going to dissolve in water. They are easily going to dissolve in water. Whereas inorganic molecules generally do not contain carbon um, and they will disassociate, but they don't fully dissolve in water. And there is a difference between the two of them there. Well, that's just a real quick uh, reminder as far as what these two guys are, are really all about. Uh, what we deal with in here are inorganic molecules. Uh, and that's exactly what we have uh, coming up next. We're going to be looking at the four basic types of organic molecules. Carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. Um, what we deal with organic chemistry is uh, the infamous carbon. It all comes down to carbon. And the reason why for that is because uh, carbon we know has four valence electrons. And those four valence electrons means that they can accept uh, four bonding sites. 
they can accept for bonding sites. It makes them very versatile in what they can bond to. And you're going to see that. You're going to see that in the next upcoming slides here um, that we're going to kind of hit uh, pretty hard here coming up uh, within the next couple of minutes. Um, don't lose sight of the fact that carbon can form single bonds, this is what this is supposed to say here, they can form, keep in mind, double bonds, I cannot type tonight, uh, and they can also form triple bonds. And so they're very versatile in what they can and cannot do. Uh, and so keep that in mind. Look for the carbon in all of these structures that we're going to be talking about and look for the types of bonds that they are creating. Right? And as we've already mentioned, there are four types of macromolecules, right? the big boys that we find within the body. Macromolecules is what we're dealing with here. Um, and the four types are carbohydrates, nucleic acids, proteins, and lipids. During this WIMBA session, uh, our focus is going to be on the first two groups, carbohydrates and nucleic acids. The next WIMBA session, part three of this, uh, is going to be dealing with proteins and lipids. Uh, and the majority of that time is going to be spent looking at proteins. Um, the other thing I need you to make sure that you are aware of is that uh, what distinguishes many of these macromolecules has to do with a functional group. And a functional group is a specific um, group of molecules that are associated with each of these macromolecules. And some of them uh, are found in more than one place. Uh, but you need to be aware of um, a couple of these so that way you can survive. Uh, and basically, I, I need you to know five of the seven that are in front of you. And they are, uh, you need to make sure that you are familiar with a hydroxyl group. Uh, and a hydroxyl group, and I'll enlarge this a little bit for you, uh, is simply a OH group that is going to be attached onto uh, typically a carbon uh, is where you're going to find it. You see here, ethanol is the example, um, and you can also see what it's found in as well, carbohydrates, proteins, nucleic acids, and lipids. Uh, we're going to find hydroxyl groups across the board. We also need to recognize and be able to identify carbonyl groups. We also need to be able to identify um, a carbonyl group. Right? Carbonyl groups are carbon double bound to an oxygen carbon double bound to an oxygen. C double bound to O. If we take a, if, if a carbonyl and a hydroxyl got together and had a little baby and had an offspring, an offspring, a, a baby functional group, that baby functional group would be called a carboxyl group. And you can see there in the diagram that a carboxyl group is a carbon double bound to an oxygen, single bound to a hydroxyl group. That is a carboxyl group. Now, there is a caveat here because carboxyls um, can also, and I'm going to come off the diagram here, carboxyls can also be... Um, a oxygen um, that is a negative, uh, it's, a, it's an ionic oxygen, it's an oxygen with a negative on it, um, can be uh, bound to a carbon, which is double bound to another oxygen. And so that uh, oxygen, that is an ion that is bound to the carbon, which is double bound to another oxygen, is also a carboxyl group. 
the next group that you need to know, must, 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 make sure you can identify an, an amino group, a nitrogen bound to hydrogen. Right, now, if it's an NH2, that is fine. Right, these will present themselves as NH2s. or NH3 uh, plus. Right, this is how they, you're typically going to see them, either an NH2 or an NH3 plus. The next one that you need to make sure that you understand is the phosphate group. Phosphates are a phosphorus in the center surrounded by oxygens, and that's going to be critical in our understanding of how uh, energy is created. All right, carbohydrate. I'm going to kind of run through this a little bit quicker. Um, I think a lot of this we already understand and we know. Um, uh, you seem to grasp it pretty well within the notes uh, when we went over this in class. Um, keep in mind, with carbohydrates, with carbohydrate, uh, you always have a two-to-one ratio of hydrogen to oxygen. That's critical. And that kind of goes back to what the whole term carbohydrate means. And if we split this guy up into its basic component, uh, we've got carbo, which means carbon, and hydrate, which means water, carbon with water. Uh, and so there's that ratio of two-to-one, right? hydrogen to oxygen. Kind of keep that in mind. Uh, and we also have three basic types of carbohydrates that we're going to consider. Uh, monosaccharides, disaccharides, and polysaccharides. With the monosaccharides, uh, we have two types. We have five carbon sugars, which are considered to be monosaccharides, and we have six carbon sugars, which are considered to be uh, monosaccharides. A monosaccharide, mono meaning one, saccharide refers to sugar. One, sugar. These are simple sugars. They're not linked together. They're not complex. They're not anything except one molecule of a sugar. Um, glucose, fructose, galactose, your basic types of sugars. Fructose is a plant-based sugar. It's a simple sugar. Glucose um, is a... Um, uh, your, like your, your regular sugar, your, your, your carbohydrate-based sugar, your, your table sugar. The lactose is a precursor to um, lactose. It's more of a dairy type of sugar. Um, and so that's your six-carbon sugars. Your five-carbon sugars really only have to deal with um, DNA and RNA, uh, deoxyribonucleic acids and ribos, uh, ribonucleic acids, your genetic material. Five-carbon sugars are two types, deoxyribose or ribose. And again, they are the sugars that are going to be dictating whether or not you are dealing with DNA or RNA. And we'll be playing, spending a lot of time looking at um, exactly how we go from DNA to RNA into protein structure. I will point out, because I want you to make sure that you understand, uh, that structurally there is a difference between deoxyribose and ribose. And that difference comes into play right here. Yeah, that difference comes into play right there. The term deoxyribose, deoxy, without oxygen. And anytime you see OSE, it's a sugar. So this is a sugar that is without an oxygen deoxyribose. And you can see right there where that arrow is pointing, that hydrogen is all by itself. The other one, right here, right, that's a hydroxide group. Right? But the hydrogen next to it is missing that oxygen. That is the, the signature characteristic that separates deoxyribose from being ribose, is that lack of an oxygen right there. You will notice over here that OH is there. That hydroxide group is there, and the hydroxide group is there. That is your difference between deoxyribose and ribose. Now, 
let's go back to our six carbon sugars. All right, because we are, have the ability to link these six carbon sugars into more complex structures. When we take two monosaccharides and link them together, we create a disaccharide. Disaccharide simply refers to di here meaning two, saccharide meaning sugars. Di saccharides. Right. And we link them together. How do we link those two sugars together? Well, we do it through this nifty little process known as dehydration synthesis. Dehydration synthesis. Synthesis. Don't lose sight of what some of these terms mean. When you synthesize something, you produce. That's not what I wanted to have happen. Uh, let's try that again. When you synthesize something, you produce it. How we are producing it is through dehydration. We're removing water. In order to produce the disaccharide, we need to remove water. One hydrogen is removed from one of the hydroxyl groups. And from the other sugar, a complete hydroxide is moved, removed. We are removing two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O. And what is left behind is an oxygen. And it is that oxygen that forms the bond between the two sugars, between the two monosaccharides, thus creating a disaccharide. So by removing a hydroxyl group from one sugar and a hydrogen ion from another sugar, we create water, and what is left behind is that lonely little oxygen by which the bond between the two monosaccharides are formed, creating the disaccharide. And if we keep doing this, if we keep doing this, we keep linking monosaccharide to monosaccharide to disaccharide to monosaccharide to disaccharide to monosaccharide, so on and so on and so on, you end up with a polysaccharide. Polysaccharides are simply three or more monosaccharides that have joined together. What have they joined together by? They've used... Dehydrate, that was not supposed to happen. Um, they use dehydration synthesis to form that. By removing a water between the two sugars that you are joining, you cause that bond to form. And you get very complex carbohydrates like what you're looking at right there. Um, Last little bit on carbohydrates that we have. Um, carbohydrates are not only used for energy within the cell, and we'll talk about this as we kind of go through this, um, but they are also used for cell-to-cell -cell communication and cell-to-cell -cell recognition. Um, when the carbohydrate, which in this case is right here, right, this here, uh, oligo here means um, many branches, and saccharides, so this is a multi-branched sugar, when it attaches itself to a protein, like what you see there, we create what we refer to as a glycoprotein. Right? Glyco because there is a, um, a carbohydrate attached to it, protein because the sugar is attached to a protein. If we want to break this stuff down, then what we simply need to do 
is the reverse of dehydration. If we're going to do the reverse of dehydration or the opposite of dehydration synthesis, that means we have to add water back in, which is the process known as hydrolysis. So hydrolysis adds water back into the system, which splits apart the disaccharide or polysaccharide and separates it down into smaller chunks. And again, that's exactly what you're seeing happening right here. There's the oxygen that was used to bound these two monosaccharides together, forming the, bi or the disaccharide. And when we add water into this system, when we add water into this system, we end up splitting the molecule. You can see that we've recreated a hydroxyl group there. We've recreated a hydroxyl group there. Nothing to bond onto. Okay. Nucleic acids. And again, at any point in time when we're going through these little limbas, um, please jot down questions that you may have, especially if I'm not addressing them now. Shoot me an email. Right? Stay in touch with me. Um, a lot of times I can't wait till the next class, so I'd rather you get that answer now. Nucleic acids. This is the second group of um, macromolecules that we need to be concerned with. There are two types of nucleic acids that we need to be concerned with. Uh, the first type of nucleic acid uh, that we need to be concerned with is DNA. And the next type of nucleic acid that we need to be concerned with is, you should guess it, RNA. The oxyribonucleic acids, DNA. Ribonucleic acids, RNA. Uh, we know that DNA is found within the nucleus. It contains the genetic material. It contains our heredity, what we look like. Our RNA is made from the DNA. RNA is made from the DNA and is involved in the production of proteins, which we're going to get into, just not yet. And so these are your two types of nucleic acids. Nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides. Nucleic acids are made up of nucleotides. And each nucleotide has a very structured formula to it. Each nucleotide is made up of three components. They are made up of a phosphate group. They are made up of a sugar. If it is DNA, that sugar is made up of deoxyribose. If it is RNA, let me come back over here real quick. If we are dealing with DNA, the sugar that is in question is deoxyribose. If we are dealing with RNA, then the sugar that we are dealing with is ribose. And remember, you need to be able to distinguish the two between the difference between a deoxyribose and a ribose. But that's what that five carbon sugar is talking about. Um, and lastly, we have ourselves um, a click the wrong button, a nitrogen base. And this is something that's going to be new for y'all. All right, that nitrogen base can be one of four bases. That nitrogen base can be one of four bases. It can be an A, it can be a T, it can be a G, it can be a C. It can be adenine, it can be thymine, it can be guanine, it can be cytosine, and sometimes it can be uracil. Right now, if you're looking for exact spellings of these guys, um, is not on that page. 
Uh, we already talked about that. Here it is right here. There's nitrogen bases. Right, so we have four basic nitrogen bases that are going to make up that nucleotide structure. Don't forget, we've got a phosphate group with phosphorus surrounded by four oxygens. We've got the sugar, either DNA or RNA. And we have nitrogen bases. And there are five potential possibilities for those nitrogen bases. If we're dealing with uh, DNA, we're dealing with adenine, guanine, cytosine, or thymine. If we're dealing with RNA, we are dealing with adenine, guanine, cytosine, or uracil. And again, all of these, what these nitrogen bases do is it dictates what the DNA and RNA looks like. Depending on the sequence that they fall in, depending on the sequence that they fall in, is going to dictate what kind of protein down the road is made. We're going to get into this a lot more heavily once we get into chapters three and four. Um, and so if you're a little bit on the foggy side right now with this, that is okay. You're allowed to be. Um, two last things that I want to touch on, and then we're going to call this a, call this a night here uh, with, uh, with this session. And that is, The nitrogen bases can be broken down into two groups. They can be broken down into pyrimidines and purines. Pyrimidines are single rung structures. Purines are single rung structures. And they are only going to be either cytosine, uracil, or thymine. They are the only three possibilities we have for pyrimidines. Purines, on the other hand, can only be either guanine or adenine. So a pyrimidine is a single rung structure that is either going to be cytosine, uracil, uracil, or thymine. And purines are going to either be guanine or adenine. And notice that they are double rung structures. Double rung structures. We'll take this one little step further, if I may. Guanine will only bond with cytosine and adenine will only bond with either uracil in RNA or thymine in DNA. Again, chapters 3 and 4, this will make a lot more sense to you. Um, and as we've already mentioned, um, just a quick word about RNA. Um, RNA is the same thing as DNA, again, with the exception there's always an exception, uh, that uh, RNA uses the sugar ribose and it relies on the nitrogen base of your cell instead of thymine, right? no thymine uh, in RNA. Your cell replaces it. The other key aspect that I want you to know and that I, I know hounded you on in lecture is that RNA is less stable. It's less stable because of that hydroxyl group that DNA doesn't have. Right? right there where that arrow is. That hydroxyl group is what makes RNA less stable. It reacts with water more easily. And when it reacts with water more easily, it falls apart easily. DNA is a lot more stable because it is less reactive, because it is missing that oxygen on that hydroxyl group, which is a good thing. You want your RNA to fall apart after so long. Otherwise, it would just keep doing what it's going to be doing, which is making proteins. And we don't want that to happen. We just don't want that to happen. All right. With all of that said, I encourage you to rewind this at any point in time. 
uh, to go back through and listen to parts that you need to revisit. If something still doesn't make sense after looking in your notes, after listening to this for a couple of times, after even diving back into the textbook and seeing if you can flush it out of the textbook, please, 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 I beg of you, shoot me an email. Don't let your questions go unanswered. It is too important uh, for you just to say, oh, never mind, I don't want to ask a stupid question, or I don't want to bug him, um, or I don't want to send him yet another email. All right? Please, bug me, bother me, send me an email. Uh, and on that note, um, why don't we end this session of WIMBA, uh, and uh, we'll get ready for part three of three, uh, which again will be dealing with proteins and lipids. Until then, this is Professor Young, uh, and this is the end of part two of three, uh, looking at biochemistry.